We begin, though, with the president's former personal attorney and longtime fixer, Michael Cohen. Today, we learned he had made tapes of conversations with his client and others, and federal authorities have those tapes. They were seized when the FBI raided Cohen, including one from September of 2016, when Cohen and then-candidate Donald Trump were talking about paying off former Playboy model Karen McDougal, who, as you know, alleged an affair with Mr. Trump about 10 years prior, while Melania Trump was pregnant and even after the birth of their son. Money above and beyond an arrangement with the National Enquirer's parent company, AMI, to buy Ms. McDougal's story and then kill it. Now, this conversation took place just two months before the election, September 2016. Several weeks later, just a few days before the election, the campaign denied any knowledge of the alleged affair or the National Enquirer deal. But that's getting ahead of the story. So let's start at the beginning, as told to me exclusively by Karen McDougal earlier this year. So tell me about your first date. Our first date, I was told we were going to go to the Beverly Hills Hotel for dinner. So he had told me that Keith, his bodyguard, was going to pick me up at a certain time, and he did. And then we were driving over to the Beverly Hills Hotel, and Keith drove around to the back, and he said, we have to get out here because we don't want to walk through the hotel. And at that minute, I'm like thinking to myself, are we going to a room? Because I thought we were having dinner at the Beverly Hills Hotel. In the actual restaurant. Right. Well, we did have dinner at the Beverly Hills Hotel, but in his bungalow instead. Uh, we had dinner there for a few hours. Uh, we talked for a few hours. We had a great time. We were getting to know each other. Um, we were talking about his birthday. And then as, as the night ended, we, we were intimate. When you got to the Beverly Hills Hotel and, and Keith said, we're not going to go through the lobby, we're going to go, was it to, a, to a, a room at the Beverly Hills Hotel or a, a, a suite or? It was a bungalow in back. A bungalow. Uh, it's the one he said he always stayed at. And in fact, every time that I met him there, it was the same exact bungalow. And uh, he, he's called it the nicest bungalow they had. So I guess that's why he chose that one. But um, that's, yeah, that's where we went every time. Well, fast forward to November 4th of 2016, the Wall Street Journal breaking the story of her allegations and the arrangement with the National Enquirer. Spokesperson Hope Hicks telling the Journal, we have no knowledge of any of this. I asked Karen McDougal about it during our interview back in March. Hope Hicks has said categorically, you did not have a relationship, mm -hmm. there's no truth to this. When you heard that denial, what did you think? Well, I think somebody's lying and I can tell you it's not me. Um, it's a little hurtful, but at the same time, I have to understand, like, if he were to have told Hips, uh, Hope that he didn't do it, I guess I understand because he's trying to protect his family, his image, things like that. But it was definitely a little like, wow, you're going to lie about that? But okay. Now, of course, it's possible that Hope Hicks herself was being lied to, but barring that, we now know that four days before the election, the campaign's chief spokesperson was lying to voters. The Cohen Trump tape shows that candidate Trump was made aware of the National Enquirer deal at least that September, two months before Hope Hicks said they knew nothing about it. Now, keep it anonymous, perhaps we should have known, given Team Trump's chronic trouble telling the truth, including the hush payments to Stormy Daniels, which Michael Cohen arranged and fronted the money for. Back in January of this year, of course, spokesman Ross Shaw said none of the allegations were true. Now here's the White House press secretary in March. Look, the president has addressed these directly and um, made very well clear that uh, none of these allegations are true. Uh, this case has already been, been won in arbitration, and anything beyond that, I would refer you to the president's out, outside counsel. Then, about a month later, here's what the president said. President, did you know about the $130,000 payment to Stormy Daniels? No, no. to ask Michael Cohen. Michael's my an attorney, and you'll have to ask Michael Cohen. Do you know where he got the money to make that payment? No, I don't know. No. Well, a few weeks later, his other attorney, Rudy Giuliani, said the president did, in fact, pay Michael Cohen. When I heard uh, Cohen's uh, retainer of 35000 when he was doing no work for the president, mm. I said, but that's how he's repaying. That's how, he, how's he, how he's repaying it, with a little profit and a little margin for paying taxes for Michael. So, okay, that's Giuliani essentially coming clean on the lie his client and the people around him had been telling for months. As for Karen McDougal, based on what we've seen so far today, the spin has just begun. 
Joining us now by phone is New York Times White House correspondent Maggie Haberman, who shares a byline with Matt Apuzzo and Michael Schmidt on the breaking story today. So there have been, I think, two different explanations from the president's attorney, from Giuliani today, since your story posted. What's mm -hmm. his latest explanation for these conversations? And uh, let's talk fast because the story might change again. <laughs> So we were given an initial explanation in which he indicated that this was a separate payment, that this was a payment um, uh, to McDougal uh, that was uh, separate and apart from this uh, arrangement that McDougal had with AMI. Uh, he called back later to clarify that this was actually supposed uh, on the tape. What they're discussing is obtaining the rights um, to her story from AMI. They, uh, Giuliani was... Uh, uh, strenuously denying that this should be construed as a reimbursement, um, although some, uh, I think, would interpret it that way. He's adamant that it is not, and I think that that has legal implications in terms of the campaign finance piece of this. Um, and in his telling of it, um, it was Trump who said, let's do this properly and with a check, and it was Michael Cohen um, uh, who either had suggested cash or didn't suggest a check in the first place. Someone close to Cohen has has uh, adamantly denied that version of events and suggested that the presentation in which um, the then-candidate was saying, let's do this all above board, um, is not how this went down. We're obviously not going to know without hearing this. The conversation is short. It's around two minutes long. It cuts off at some point before the conversation is done. There are portions of it that are apparently inaudible in the transcript. Um, and, and it will, you know, I think it will have to be heard you know, by any of us to really understand what's being said. But what it clearly does, as you say, is undercut what the campaign told the Wall Street Journal in October of 2016, which was that they knew nothing about this. That's obviously not true. Whether Hope Hicks, who made that statement, was aware of that, I don't know. It's very possible that Donald Trump didn't tell her the truth. Um, but it, it raises questions about the president's credibility at a time when his folks are trying to undermine Michael Cohen. What's amazing about Giuliani's, both of Giuliani's explanations, that it, let's take either one, and the first one is that this would have been an addition, they were discussing an additional payment to Karen McDougal. The a AMI was claiming, well, we weren't paying for her silence, we were paying her for the, the rights to her story, which we then didn't right. really believe, so, so we didn't publish it, but we also wanted her to be a columnist. If they were discussing just giving a pay another payment to Karen McDougal, that is certainly... Uh, pretty stunning. Uh, I understand why he would call back then and say, oh, actually, no, that's not what that was, even though that's what I just said it was. It was actually they were buying the, the, the rights to the story. But well, that doesn't make much more It doesn't sense make any sense. I mean, I, I, Donald, Donald Trump is not a publisher. And I don't, he's right. Not Trump like he's magazine, I think, lasted for w one or two editions right. uh, and, and doesn't and exist and anymore. This would, not, this would not have been a story you would have seen in it. So that neither, is also true. The, 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 the distinction in the, in the explanations, I think, has a legal one. I think, as opposed to a personal one, but per the personal one, either way, um, is problematic for the president. There is there is no landscape in which this is a a good thing for him right. uh, in terms of in terms of what he has said about this before. I mean, frankly, what makes the most sense in terms of them paying AMI is it does sound. Uh, I mean, what makes the most sense just logically is they are reimbursing AMI for doing them a solid of buying Karen McDougal's life rights, and so. I mean, that seems to be what the president, what Donald Trump would have been talking to his attorney about, not like buying her life rights so that they could do something with it or, or bury them because AMI had already buried them. Well, or it could be that they were trying to buy it just so that they had, they had control over it and bury it themselves. But what I don't think they were trying to do was, bear, was buy them so that they could tell her story. Again, to, just back to the original point of why someone would own the rights um, and what you do with them, there is no... Uh, credible explanation why Donald Trump would want those other than to put them on a shelf somewhere. Yeah. So, um, so I think that that's, that's where this ends up not making sense. I mean, again, Giuliani kept describing this as exculpatory, um, and, and it may be in the legal sense. I think that, because I'm not a lawyer, so I can't, and I don't know what specifically is said on the tape because we haven't heard it. Um, what we were told by people close to both sides is this is the only, and this was another point of clarification, initially we were told this is the only audio of them. Then we were told this is the only one of substance, meaning this is the only one that isn't, you know, call me, call me back, I'll call you. This is the only one that features a conversation of anything that is material to that search warrant on Michael Cohen in the first place in April. And and the your understanding is that the president had no idea that Michael Cohen had recorded him? 
Uh, no, the president did not know that he was recorded. Um, it's still confusing to me how this recording came to be, why it's so short, uh, and so forth. Um, you know, we know that Michael Cohen had a long uh, history of taping people, um, but, you know, he often told people that he taped himself as well as reminders of notes or to, you know, uh, to, to, remi- to pr- you know, prompt him about something in the future when he was trying to uh, do projects or take care of things. I, I, we don't know how many recordings were seized. Um, you know, there are a lot of unanswered questions with this, but uh, what is clear is the timing of the recording um, is evidence that the president had to have known about right. Aaron McDougall and these payments when his campaign was saying that's not true.